The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were the worst offenders in living than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree. Still I found none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Hear the gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Over the summer, I came here uh, to meet with Father John to speak about the upcoming year and my placement here with you all at Colorunda. We are both artists, so it's not surprising the subject of art arose. On entering the church, I was met by the riotous colour of a beautiful tree. Between the branches, I found birds of all shapes and sizes and colours, some nesting, some roosting, one cheeky fellow hanging upside down. Here was an image of the kingdom, a community of abundance, fellowship, and safety, all held in the loving embrace of the tree's branches. Today's gospel presents us with a tree of a different sort. And words from Jesus are extremely harsh. Repent or perish. Lent presents itself as a time of growth. Year in year out, we are offered time and space to turn inward. We can look within ourselves and open the locked box of uncomfortable things we'd rather not face and expose them to the light. How we do this may vary. Some may fast, giving up that little indulgence that in its absence we may turn to God. Others may take up a new form of prayer or other devotional practice, perhaps joining the Walking Through Lent program offered in the parish. Others still may give to charity and seek ways to reach out in loving kindness to those in need. 
In all these Lenten practices, there is a common aim that we turn away from our selfish desires and turn towards God. Importantly, in my opinion, Lent should also form a time of communal introspection and repentance, examining the society within which we live, work, and yes, even worship. It is also a time to contemplate that so small word, sin. Lent is also a time to wrestle with the thorny problem. Do bad things only happen to those who sin? Our gospel reading speaks into this very issue. Jesus has now turned his face towards Jerusalem and is on the road that will ultimately lead to Golgotha and the cross. Accompanying Jesus are crowds of people, people who have found or think they have found their king, their Messiah, a warrior in the model of David, one who will bring about salvation from the oppressive Roman rulers, possibly through violent means. Some from the crowd speak telling him of the appalling acts of Pilate in Galilee, the horrific act of killing people during their worship. We may miss cast our minds back to the many um, news items of horror in the attacks of people in churches, synagogues and mosques over the recent years to gain a visceral sense of the shock and disgust that is in this incident. When considering this news, it's vital to note that these Galileans were Jesus' fellow countrymen, perhaps people he knew, neighbors, shopkeepers, maybe even friends, all consumed in the violence of Pilate. Maybe those in the in the crowd hoped this news would be the catalyst. This would start the revolution. What Jesus does with this news is intriguing. Instead of anger, this becomes a teaching moment. The lesson becomes one of sin, repentance, and mercy. Jesus draws on a school of wisdom from the scriptures and asks the crowd, were those Galileans who died worse sinners than all the other Galileans? This may sound alien to modern readers. Why would they be sinners? Wasn't Pilate the sinner here? However, the prevailing worldview of that time was one in which your actions bring about practical consequences. Maybe we hear this today. You reap what you sow. Good for good and bad for bad. So that mob of Galileans, well, they were just the worst sort of political rabble rousers, and their actions, their sin, brought danger to the local area, and they paid the price. Equally, those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, an incident we would consider a horrific accident, well, in secret, those 18s must have been Awful sinners, or they wouldn't have died that way. Of course, as modern people, we no longer think this way, right? Perhaps a cursory questioning of the experience of women who spoke out during the Me Too movement might disabuse you of this opinion. She was wearing a short skirt. She was out late. She was drunk. She was asking for it. Jesus gives us his emphatic answer to this way of thinking. It is short, just two letters in English. No. 
Jesus presents a countercultural response. People who suffer are not worse sinners than those who prosper. The reality is that those who suffer, the poor and the marginalised, are more likely to be sinned against as the powerful continue to pursue power, crushing any who get in the way. Instead, Jesus calls to each of us, first with the challenging message, we are all sinners, we are all in need of repentance. So we hear his harsh words, repent or perish. Yet at the same time, we also hear a message of mercy and the opportunity to amend our ways in the parable of the barren fig tree. This fig tree has been barren for three years and the owner, perhaps making a rash judgment in error, wants to take drastic action, cut it down. The gardener suggests another approach. Give the tree the appropriate care. Enrich the soil and see what happens. The proof will be in the fruit. Unlike the other parables found in this chapter, this parable contains no suggestion that it is an image of the kingdom of God. Instead, we might consider this a vision of humanity's deep need for the inbreaking kingdom with its transformative justice that breaks open the view that the faithful prosper and the sinful suffer, a kingdom that would never say she was asking for it. So we return to those harsh words of Jesus. These words may be less harsh than first appearances. The term repent or metanoia in Greek means to turn around to stop what you're doing, or perhaps to stretch the meaning a little, to return home. When we are diverted from the path of equal flourishing for all humanity, when we apply rash judgment in error, we miss the fullness of community that may unfold, and part of us perishes. And this is true both for our individual lives, and that of the institutions within which we live, work, and worship. During our Lenten journey, we may take this opportunity to turn around, to go home, to follow the command of Jesus, and allow ourselves to be gathered into the branches of the kingdom, the hospitable kingdom a place of life, abundance, and safety. The Lord be with you.